Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another World of Warcraft live developer Q&A. My name is Josh Allen, a.k.a. Community Manager Lord, joined here once again by game de a game game developer, game director. I am a game developer. Developer oh, also, thing I do. yeah. yeah. Uh, Ian Hezekosis, thanks so much for being here. Great to be here as always. Yeah, uh, just a few things have happened since we last met. A couple things, yeah. yeah. We, we released a game. Uh, it's, you know, celebrating it with matching shirts. We, we coordinated this. We actually planned this weeks in advance. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, it's been it's super exciting to see the whole world finally getting a chance to explore Kul Tiras and Zandalar and just dig into this, this labor of love from the Warcraft team as a whole over the last two plus years. And it's the beginning of an awesome journey to come, but really just enjoying seeing everybody yeah. actually getting into what we've made. Yeah, it's been it's been a long road to get here, and the road just keeps on going. So uh, we've got a lot to we actually got a lot yep. to talk about here today as well. I know there was a couple of things you wanted to mention just right off the bat at the start um, here before we get into questions. Actually, we have one just sort of general to sort of catch all topic. I'm not sure how many class questions we have today, but I think I know that I've seen a lot of questions and discussion in the community about you know, hey, you fixed arms mastery. What about my class or you did this thing to feral druids to help their aoe but i don't think you went far enough or we have other problems in other areas too or other specs feel like they need attention as well we're not we're not done we don't just because we haven't made a change doesn't mean we think everything is perfect we don't think things are perfect on that front but when we actually start getting into sort of holistic spec balancing in the run-up to you know mythic rating opening up and higher level mythic keys and so forth as well as the pvp season i think we want a lot more data and we want to do a broader pass over multiple specs rather than making piecemeal changes one at a time i think the change we made to, to arms mastery was because it was so drastically out of whack that gear with mastery on it was virtually worthless to arms warriors and that was a problem we thought we needed to fix in the short term same thing with feral druids and the aoe they bring to dungeons um Feral Druids aren't supposed to be the kings of AoE. I think, you know, specs have strengths and weaknesses and different areas where they're going to shine. And that's just not a strength of theirs. But it's unacceptable for even an area of weakness to be so far behind mm. the norm that other specs are bringing for a core type of content, like, you know, clearing mobs in a dungeon. And so that's something we needed to address. But we're not done. And so I just wanted to make that crystal clear. Uh, we'll have more to say. We're listening to feedback. We're keeping an eye on the tons and tons of data that's coming out of everybody running through dungeons, getting into PvP and so forth. And we'll have more to do in the future. Would it be fair to say that at this stage, because like the expansion's been out for a week and a half at this point, yeah. would it be fair to say that at this stage, we're mostly just looking for things that are way out of whack that we know that we can pull in line um, and then as time goes on we get more data we get more looks at people doing mythic dungeons and so on exactly we can refine it from there exactly i think um i would expect and this is you know may change but i think our target would be to have our first significant balance pass come at the end of that first week of september so at the end of the week um when raids open when the pvp season begins before that second week going into Mythic Raids. As right. always, we try to avoid making drastic, drastic changes that are going to make guilds feel like they need to change their whole roster or something. But that's really when the end game as a whole comes into its own. I think right now what we're seeing is... I mean, so you saw the same thing early in Legion, too. I, I recall at the start of Legion, it was Havoc Demon Hunters and Windwalker Monks that were right. head and shoulders above everybody else because the game right now is running Heroic Dungeons. It's running Mythic Zero Dungeons once per dungeon per week. And your boss encounters in that are not super long. You're mostly looking to quickly and efficiently clear large chunks of mobs. And that's what the end game is all about. The other types of damage, the other types of situations that we bounce around more holistically, like the six minute patchwork fight or the right. you know, council fight where it's sustained ranged cleave between multiple targets, those situations just don't exist in the game. And so classes and specs that will shine in those situations aren't seeing that reflected. And similarly, once the dungeon scene moves on into Mythic Keystones, and now you're thinking about meeting the single target DPS check on a tough tyrannical boss, that's a very different world that exists currently, and different classes and specs will get their chance to shine. We want to make sure that we're balancing around that world that we're going to be living in for the next couple of years, not the one that we're only living in for the next two weeks. Makes a lot of sense. Sounds a lot of good. 
let's get started on these questions. We're going to come <laughs> right out of the gate with a, with a big one here um, from Lagta, who asked, uh, any plans on curbing back the PvE world mob scaling? Uh, they feel like damage sponges even above heroic dungeon item level. So obviously we've been seeing a lot of discussion about this over the last couple of days, a few threads popping up on Reddit and so yes. on. Uh, what's going on with the world scaling? Well, so just take off your Heart of Azeroth and put it in the bank, and then everything is fixed. Moving on? Uh, no, so, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of discussion, a lot of rumor, a lot of speculation about how this works. Um, so, in-game outdoor world scaling, this is something that literally hasn't really changed in 15 months. Um, we rolled this out in Legion, patch 7.2, made some initial adjustments in response to very valid feedback about, you know, the original version of it increased mob damage as your item level went up. That's completely gone. That doesn't change at all. We've also pulled back on how much scaling occurs to begin with. Um, so two questions, I guess. First off, why do we do this at all? And it's, it's because the outdoor world in the structure that we introduced in Legion that we continue to maintain in Battle for Azeroth remains relevant for far longer than ever before, and it offers increasing rewards. Players have noticed that as your item level increases, as you get more heroic dungeon gear, let's say, world quest rewards also keep pace with that. And so rather than like discrete difficulty levels like we have in dungeons with normal heroic mythic, we want some sense of, yeah, you know, the world is a little bit keeping pace with you, but far, far, far slower because you're still getting better rewards out of it. Next, we know there's going to be a tremendous amount of scaling over the course of the expansion and a danger and one that we saw come to pass in patch 715 when people had full night hold gear and powered up artifacts was while world quests were still relevant players were so strong relative to that content that it was actually disrupting the core game experience that we tune around like when you're winding up a 2.5 second cast or a two second cast to begin a fight and a warrior charges in and uses two gcds to kill the mob within 1.5 seconds before your missile even hits the target, and you don't get credit, despite being there and you thought you were about to attack a completely untapped out-of-combat mob, that feels kind of broken. We're not looking to act to, you know, to limit or prevent the feeling of getting way, way, way stronger and returning to stuff that once gave you a challenge and crushing it. That's a core part of the endgame progression. We're just looking to set some guardrails to make sure that people aren't scaling so far beyond what our content really is built to support and this the core pacing and mechanics of WoW combat. So some actual numbers here. All right, roughly, you know, for every 10 item levels or so that you get, I think there was actually a pretty good post on Reddit digging into the numbers here, creatures in the world will end up with 3 to 4% more health. And that, that scaling only starts once you're getting into Dungeon Blues territory. So when, I, when I've, we've seen feedback, and, and part of why we didn't respond to this initially, actually, you know, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of people asking us questions, it's we wanted to make sure we didn't miss something because right. when there's hundreds of people saying, hey, your game is broken, mobs are scaling out of control, we didn't want to just come back and say, no, they're not, without making sure that, you know, we're, we're, not, right. we're, not, certainly yeah. not, we're certainly not perfect. And we're like, oh, crap, everyone thinks this is happening. Let's really dig into this. And so we spent a lot of time digging through the numbers, digging through the code, testing ourselves, having, you know, QA help us with this. And we found that it's all working as intended. You know, some actual numbers. If you hit max level at eye level 280, um, which is you know pretty typical 280, 285. After a couple of weeks, you've done some heroic dungeons, you've done some mythic dungeons, your eye level is like in the 330, 340 range. You're probably 60, 70% stronger than you, than you were when you first hit max level. You're going to have tens of thousands more health, and instead of hitting for you know 5,000, you're going to be hitting for 7,000, 8,000. From that whole gain, mobs might gain an extra you know, 7,000, 8,000 health they might gain 15% health from all of that. You're getting 60% stronger. The mobs are scaling at a much slower rate compared to that. You are and should be getting stronger. And they're like so, 15 to 20% stronger at that point. It, exactly. And I think, and just to be clear, philosophically, completely recognize progression is a core part of RPGs in general. It's a core part of World of Warcraft. The goal isn't that, hey, this world quest that took you five minutes to complete the day you hit 120 still takes you five minutes to complete weeks later. It's going to be a fraction of that time in the long run, um, and that's completely by design. Now, with regard to the specific question, I think if there are specific enemies that feel like they you know, are absorbing a lot of damage, there are definitely some outliers there that we've been tweaking, some world quest targets or some quest bosses in the world that just have more health than they should. Um, those are mob-specific outliers, but the pacing around the game as a whole is something that we actually feel we have a pretty good handle on, and it's playing out 
the way we expected. Now, there's also some issues with individual specs and their performance, um, and that's something that, as I alluded to at the start of the talk, we're going to be digging into very soon. Yeah, and I know I know we've already done a couple of hot fixes to specific world quests also that were like either not enough mobs respawning or uh, certain like bosses for the like elite world quests had too much health or something like that. So those are things that we can fix as well. Totally. Um, but yeah, the the core of what I'm getting here is yes, there's a small amount of scaling. You should be scaling much faster than the mobs are actually scaling, yep. and it is still very very important that yep. you can eventually just obliterate. These also, things. just to dispel some other rumors, we've changed nothing here. Like I've seen threads that were speculating that oh, you used to be able to unequip your gear or put it in the bank, and right. that made the world easier. But oh, Blizzard Ninja hot fixed it. We actually this is literally it as it's worked. worked since March 2017. We have touched nothing. <laughs> um, so and and the reason why. We also didn't make a bigger deal of this or you know discuss it in depth in the past is this is just how legion this is how all of argus work this is how all of broken shore work this is how world of warcraft has worked for the last 15 months and if power scaling over the course if you played through legion and as you geared up in Antorus, if argus felt appropriately easier for you over time that was a system working as we intended and so we felt like it was something that was working well Obviously, there's been a lot of you know recent discussion around it and, and people concerned with, with the approach we've taken, which has led to us re-examining it. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and move on. A uh, question here from Odin, uh, semi-related actually, uh, who asked, what is the development team's thinking behind the power gain of leveling? I and many others feel weaker as we level through BFA, which feels counterintuitive to level progression in an RPG. So kind of talking yeah. about similar general concept, but rather than once I'm at max level and I'm gaining more gear yeah. and mobs are scaling up, this is literally just talking about as I'm progressing from 110 mm -hmm. to 119, basically. Um, this, 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 is a, this is a very valid criticism, and it's a concern that we share. It's something we're talking about on a regular basis and how to do better on next time. Uh, it's This has been... A somewhat awkward aspect of leveling in a new expansion in World of Warcraft forever, like literally since since Burning Crusade, because um, to some extent an expansion represents a reset. It represents catch up for those who didn't play the last expansion. It represents a fresh start as you begin a new journey through gearing up and overcoming the challenges that a new world has to offer. Green is the new purple, it, exactly, yeah. um, or the new orange, as the case may be. Um, but yeah, so I think I mean if you think back to Mists of Pandaria, let's say, when you started out, or, or Warlords, or any of those expansions, you were probably crushing things in Jade Forest, or Frostfire slash Shadow Moon. And then by the time you were halfway through the expansion, you were starting to have a slightly tougher time with those mobs. They weren't melting quite as quickly. And then when you hit max level, things in Dread Wastes, or things in, in Nagrand, in Warlords, they actually put up a good fight, and they were dangerous. You couldn't pull three of those mobs at the same time, at least when you first hit max level. But then as you got dungeon gear, as you eventually got epics things shifted back. But that didn't feel the same way. It felt like, oh, well, of course, these mobs are tougher because, well, Nagran is dangerous. Frostfire is full of weaklings that I can go crush, but this is, you know, the home of some of the mightiest forces of the Iron Horde, and so I need to gear up before I can overcome them. That made sense in traditional RPG contexts. The flip side there is that when you hit max level, like 90 plus percent of the world was completely irrelevant to you because it was full of these low level mobs that offered no challenge, no rewards. And so you spent a few hours, you might have spent one or two days playing through this vast world that we constructed, but then only would spend you know the rest of your months in a tiny fraction of that world. And that felt like a missed opportunity and you know shallower than we wanted, which is why we shifted to this scaling open world model in Legion where the entire world is relevant at max level and in fact multiple new zones can open up at max level. The problem with that, of course, is well now it's not the forces in Nagrand are mighty and I need to gear up to overcome them. It's while I was off questing in Nazmir and Voldun, I came back to Zoldazar and these things that I crushed at level 112 are now giving me a challenge at level 120 and it's the same mob and it's the same area right. and it's often the same type of quest. Um, and that, 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 that doesn't feel great. We, we're aware of that. Um, on balance, I think that once we settle into a groove at max level and begin gearing up again and overcoming that power setback, it is worth that sacrifice in terms of having the entire world available as playable space that can be relevant. But we have more work to do there. I think it, that's we're, we're looking for that silver bullet in you know future expansions that will let us combine the open world's relevance with a feeling that you know you're still 
you, that, that you're not actually sliding backwards as you level. Cause, but the reality is, in terms of your relative feel to the world, that does need to happen on some level, right? Like it's okay at the end of an expansion that you are destroying elites solo, that you're going into an area and pulling four or five enemies at a time. But a new expansion can't start at that point or there's nowhere to go. Where do you go from that point? Like you're just, I don't know, training through and just killing 30, 40 things with yeah. you know, zero effort the way you might go back to a raid from multiple expansions ago. That, that's not where the game can exist. But psychologically, completely understands that it, it just kind of a feels bad moment right now. Yeah, and like you say, it's it's something that's been the case for every expansion ever, going all the way back to Burning Crusade. Yeah. Um, it was something that we saw in Legion as well to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess TLDR, yes, we recognize it as an issue. Okay. Looking for that perfect fix for it still. A uh, question here from Mad One, who says, uh, level scaling has odd consequences, such as 110s dominating mm -hmm. 120s in world PvP, uh, and dual gathering alts locking experience, since they're more powerful at 110 than 120. Any plans to change how level scaling works? So I saw a hot fix go out for the world PvP thing. Um, what's going on there? So yes, uh, we actually applied a hot fix last night that significantly reduces the benefit given um, to lower level players in world PvP in the new lands. Basically, so our logic here was, with war mode being a thing, we, we, we've, we've always known that the, fr the, the worst, you know, the, the frustrating parts of world PvP are the completely, completely one-sided, lopsided matchups, where someone who has raid gear, who's exponentially more powerful than you, walks up and just destroys you. Now, we want item level to matter, but we don't want it to be completely, you know, dispositive to the point where you have no chance whatsoever. And I think we were going way too far to prop up lower level characters relative to what people were at max level. Mm. A 120 should have an advantage over a 110, even if that 110 had Mythic and Taurus gear and optimal legendaries in that full setup. Now, it's probably going to be close. Um, the, you know, the 120 shouldn't be able to just roll over the 110, but you should never feel like you're advantaged for staying at lower level. We think the changes we made got us there. If they haven't, we're going to continue to tweak things, but that's our goal. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, moving on, next question from Salsimus. Salsissimus? There's a lot of S's in this name. Uh, who asks, what is the design philosophy Philosophy, excuse me, behind item level increasing so rapidly from the start of an expansion? Uh, and does this mean we should expect a BFA-like squish every or every other expansion? Uh, so definitely not every expansion. Um, maybe every other or every third, honestly. And that's part of why we, we took steps in BFA to make it a much more streamlined process in the future so that it'll be less prone to errors and scaling problems and, and misses on our part. Um, the, the reason why this is the case, and, I, and this is a question that's raised often, I think, you know, often in the context of the world of the outdoor world scaling question we just talked about a few minutes ago, players often ask, and, and, and reasonably so, well, why don't you just give us less power and then this wouldn't be a problem. Instead of having mob scale, why not just you know make every tier 10 item levels instead of 15 or make an item level mean less and then don't have the outdoor world scale at all? The reason why we have this is it's, it's proven necessary over time both for difficulty progression and reward progression for upgrades to feel meaningful through our dungeon and raid endgame. We have multiple difficulties and moving up from normal to heroic or heroic to mythic. I think items need, we found that items need to be about 10 to 15% better than what you already have in order to actually have upgrades feel like upgrades. And also with, with smaller gaps than that, it often comes down to, well, this has a bit more of this stat than that stat, and I don't really care as much about the item itself or the item level, which then translates to, I go into a new difficulty, I kill a mythic raid boss for the first time, and this should be a moment of excitement, but actually no one is particularly pleased with the loot that's on the corpse. Right. And maybe you're vendoring things, you're like, okay, this is, I guess, like a tiny, tiny 0.1% upgrade. That doesn't feel great. The other thing that it lets us do is there are huge skill gaps in World of Warcraft. That's that's the thing. I mean, the reality is, is if there are, you know, the people at the very highest levels of the game are tremendously, massively more skilled than you or I, or even the people that are, you know, top 100 or top 1,000. And, and so on down from there. And that's the other part of just progression and power progression in an MMO. I think over time, people can, by, by powering up, by getting better gear, effectively bring content that was out of reach within reach for them. And if those gaps are only like 
five, six percent if fully geared up in gear from you know the first ten bosses in Antorus, I'm only six percent stronger than I was when I started. That's not enough to make up the gap between you and the people who did it as the right. trailblazers. And so it all of those reasons make us feel that we need these gaps between tiers. It's also when a new patch comes out. You know, if you've been doing to use Legion examples because they're familiar. If you were doing Heroic Tomb of Sargeras, but you only got to Heroic Tomb of Sargeras in the second half of the tier, maybe your guild started with normal, you worked your way up through Heroic, but it was tough for you. You were kind of pushing the limits of your abilities, and Taurus comes out. Okay, you're going to start normal in Taurus because that's who you really are. You're at your core, a normal mode raid guild that kind of pushes into Heroic a bit towards the end of a tier. If that normal mode in Taurus gear isn't any better than the Heroic Tomb gear that you've spent the last few months earning, Right. Well, then what's even like, what do you do? You have nowhere to go. You have no meaningful rewards. You might feel pushed into heroic right away before you're actually ready for it. And so we've tweaked, you know, we've, we've experimented with different with different values here, different rates of progression over the years. I think the structure that we've settled into is one that feels pretty stable and works. And so we're balancing the rest of the game and adjusting the rest of the game around that core. Yeah, it's a it's kind of a, a function of Yes, it's a little bit weird when we have to squish item levels, but we're s avoiding so many other issues by putting ourselves in that situation. Basically. So, cool. Uh, next question from Luna Vale, who asked, uh, do you feel that the removal of auto accept and searching for groups by add-ons was a worthwhile enough change for the expense of the in individual player's enjoyment and time? So kind of talking about yeah. um, things like World Quest Group Finder and so on. Um, that used to be able to just sort of instantly join a group for a world quest and have it completed within basically a couple of seconds yeah. half the time. Um, so, uh, again, obviously this is a contentious issue. Completely understand there is there is value in a button that you can press where you push this button and it completes your quest for you in a matter of seconds, like you said. Um, and that's that's essentially what it, what it was. Um, and there's, it's completely natural to... to like that and to want it and to miss to miss it when it's gone. The problem that that posed for us in terms of the overall pacing of the World Quest experience and how to reward it is that it created a huge gap between people using these add-ons and approaching the game this way and those who weren't. Uh, a World Quest, if you are doing it organically, you know, standard solo World Quest, it's kill 10 enemies, free 6 prisoners from these cages. That might take you a couple of minutes to do. And if you wanted to form a group organically, socially for it, you might ground up early in the expansion in Legion. We saw a lot of people who say, hey, I'm going to go do some emissaries. And you want to tag along. And the few of you could go in a loop and do those things together, gaining efficiency benefits through, a, through the actual social experience. I think what World Quest Group Finder and its ilk turned into were just an asocial, I don't really care or think about these as other players. I just push this button and the bar goes up five times as fast, which feels good. The problem is, what does that experience turn into both in terms of how we reward it and how it's actually paced? So when we're giving rewards like items and artifact power, we are comparing the rate of acquisition of those items in terms of our broader systems and rewards tuning to how long does it take to run a dungeon? How long does it take to queue for skirmishes and do those or to do it a random BG or a rated BG or to queue for LFR? Because we want these rewards to feel roughly commensurate with each other, um, accounting for things like difficulty level and overall time investment so that the person who just likes doing outdoor content, they think you know even random raids or dungeons are a bit too stressful for them. They'd rather just kind of do things at their own pace. They, wanna, they don't want to have to worry about getting up and AFKing to take care of something on short notice. They should be able to play that way and feel rewarded for it, whereas someone who wants to just grind dungeons because they love tanking mobs and that's the type of gameplay they enjoy, they should be able to do that. In a world where a world quest can either take two to three minutes to complete or 15 to 20 seconds if you're using this add-on, that's almost an impossible balance to strike. Right. It also raises the question for us of what that holistic experience looks like. If I'm going out and doing a bunch of world quests and I'm using an add-on to facilitate completing them super fast, world questing is basically just running around the world. Like, if I go out and do emissaries and I'm doing 10 world quests with group finder add-ons, your experience is probably 90% travel time, 10% actually quest time. And that's that's a, that's kind of tedious in that it, in, in a weird way, it's this self-reinforcing loop where people would often ask like, well, this isn't any fun. I just want to use this add-on to automate the process. But well, part of why it's not fun, of course, it's not, a, it's not a particularly fun activity to just run from point A to point B, push a button, 
wait for a bar to fill up or a quest to complete. Maybe you're you know clicking on a thing or two or killing a mob or two as you're doing it and then repeating versus a more balanced experience where you're using your whistle, you're taking a flight path to an area near a couple of world quests, there's two near each other, you're going to spend some time actually doing game mechanics, fighting, en fight en fighting enemies, playing your class, doing your rotation, and then moving on. That's more what the experience as a whole was tuned around. And so in a world where a portion of the players were playing one game and another portion were playing another based on an add-on, there were large problems in terms of how we would tune and reward this experience. And for the question of, well, why didn't we just roll this into our base UI and give everybody a button to auto-form these groups without needing add-ons, I think the second point that I raised is why. We, we feel like if we did that, the pacing of a World Quest experience shouldn't be 90% travel time. Right, right? There's yeah. a version here where we add an auto-accept function and add auto-grouping to every World Quest, but then that kill 8 objective probably turns into a kill 30 objective just to keep that experience reasonable in comparison to how rewarding and how much time it takes to do dungeons and, and so forth. Um, that said, we do have default functionality for elites, for all group quests, where you can just click the eye and it'll form or find a group for you. Those groups have auto-accept functionality, and that's a super seamless process. Okay. Um, so I guess kind of, kind of the core of it here is we stepped back... We took a step back, looked at it, and said, "Okay, so we've kind of we kind of got two directions we can go here. We can either a because we want to we want to make sure everybody's having the same general play experience. We can either a um, break the break the add-ons, get rid of the auto accept, and make everybody do world quests in the in the same general manner that way, or b sort of embrace the notion that world quests take ten seconds to finish. But in order to do that, we would then have to make it yeah. so that the reward was like ten silver for world quests. So rather than making world quest rewards suck." We're just making it so that you have to actually do something for your piece of gear. Yeah, or world quests are drastically over rewarding compared to other activities, right, and yeah. you shouldn't actually, you know, you're doing it wrong if you do dungeons. Okay, for for example, um, yeah. So then, I guess the answer to the the core of the question was it a worthwhile enough change given the expenses? We, is yeah, it we was think a worthwhile it was change. Yes. And also things like broader auto accept functionality, for what it's worth. I think that also enabled a lot of other sort of economically harmful behaviors like realm hopping trivially for gathering, which was also obnoxious when people would piggyback onto others' groups, not to actually join the group, but just to switch shards in search of new herbs right. or ore. Um, we, we added auto accept originally. It, it was not part of the initial iteration of the group finder, and it was there for those cases where you really you don't really care about someone's item level or class or role. You just want warm bodies like to help kill a world boss. And so what we've done is limit its functionality to those situations. So when you are forming a world boss group, yep, it'll auto accept and rapidly fill. But really we don't no one's forming a heroic dungeon group, let alone a mythic dungeon group, with just auto accept turned on and no care in the world for who applies. Right, yeah. I'll I'll take five rogues and a death yeah, knight exactly through my through my mythic dungeon. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Next question comes from Jatul, who asked, are there any plans to fix the auction house and guild bank features Excuse me, for select high pop realms? Currently, these two interfaces are extremely laggy yeah. and make both of these features, with and without add-ons, pretty much unusable. Um, so this is something that um, like you and I and a couple other people here have been talking about a lot over the last um, week or so because it is a, an mm -hmm. issue. Um, where are we standing on this right now? So, yeah, this is a def definite issue, hot topic around the office, hot topic in the community. Um, what, what we've seen actually, so over the years, our technology has improved to the point that we have far more people on individual WoW realms than we ever have in the past through you know, advances like sharding that we rolled out in Legion. We literally have like multiple times more people on a server but the auction house infrastructure has lagged behind. And so what we've, you know, as we add more people into our world, we're hitting new bottlenecks that haven't been issues before. And that's why this is popping up now when it hasn't been an issue in the past. We have a couple of, we're approaching this from two angles in parallel. First off, on the engineering side, we're looking at optimizations and performance improvements that we can do from a you know, database searching perspective just to help make that process smoother. On the other hand, part of what makes this awkward, both from a database cost perspective, but also just a usability perspective, is I'm sure people have seen the you know, 271 single stacks of cloth or ore or whatever. And we have some tweaks to uh, tweaks in the works that we're going to roll out actually in the next few days, probably to PTR first and then the live servers, to the way the deposit works when you list an item for sale on the auction house. So when you list an item for sale, 
you put up a deposit, effectively, effectively a listing fee. If the item sells, then that is refunded to you, you pay nothing. If the item doesn't sell, then you forfeited your deposit. Right now, that deposit is based on the vendor value of the goods in question, which for the case of trade skill goods is very, very low. So you can effectively list these things for free, and it costs basically the same or only marginally more to list 200 single stacks versus one 200 stack. Um, we're making a change where the deposit will instead be proportional to the amount that you're listing the good for. This change will only apply to select stackable trade skills, trade skill goods. This is going to apply to your cloth, your leather, your ore, your herbs, things like that. It's not going to apply to crafted items like flasks or armor or weapons or whatever. Right. But what that means is that effectively it will cost way more in deposit terms to list many, many, many single stacks than it is that will to list a handful of smaller stacks or sorry, a handful of larger stacks. Um, exact details will be rolled out in a post. The goal here is this will help with performance, but it's also just to encourage people to be better auction house citizens and to make the right way to make your profit on the auction house while you provide goods to people who want them to not be cluttering up the auction house with page after page after page of single stacks, but rather to consolidate a bit more. Yeah, I need 300 leather for this, so let me press buy 300 times. Exactly. Yeah, okay. And so that way it's kind of the notion, I'm just gonna use made up numbers, but say there was a, a five gold extra deposit per auction that needed to be listed for each piece of leather at that point, or for each auction of leather, sorry. Yeah. So that way, if you list 10 things, then now you're paying 50 gold, whereas if you just were to put one stack of 10, it's just that five gold cost. Yes, exactly. And these are 100% yep. made up numbers, but yep. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see here, next question uh, coming from As a Druid, who asked, uh, are you going to put guild permissions back to how they were before? The current system is very restrictive and makes it harder to run a guild, which is arguably the backbone of all communities in WoW. I know mm -hmm. we've seen, uh, basically since Patch 8.0 came out, we've seen a lot of discussion about yeah. the guild system, about the community system. What's going on with guilds specifically? Okay, so I think, actually, I don't think it's arguable at all. I think guilds are absolutely the backbone of community in WoW. Um, We've made a couple of changes already based on feedback. Uh, players in guilds, again, have the ability to edit their own notes by default, and we've re-added the ability to change rank permissions for guild leaders to have someone who can't speak in guild chat if you want to have a rank that is just muted. Of, you know, right. People are getting into an argument or someone's being super annoying and you want a way of de-escalating that situation without kicking them from the guild, you can once again do that. And I think we're still looking and listening for feedback on specific things that are that are missing that are helpful to running and or moderating your guild, and we're, we'll re-add functionality where possible. Uh, now, the question of why did this change at all? Why mess with something that wasn't broken? Well, in order to make communities work, in order to make guilds work on the community infrastructure, this whole system is actually uh, going through battle, the Battle.net backbone for Battle.net groups and the way that's constructed. It has a lot of upsides, including voice chat integration seamlessly, including persistent chat history, so you can, if you log on in the middle of a conversation, you, you know what people were talking about before you logged on. But that meant effectively reconstructing every bit of the old guild logic on these new foundations. And so in doing that, we looked at, you know, some statistics and data on how often these different customizations and options were used. Many of them were, were used very, very uncommonly. And so in the, in the interests of also sort of simplifying and streamlining that whole process, so there aren't a million checkboxes when you're looking to set up your guild permissions, we consolidated a few of those under the general umbrella category of, are you an officer? This is what officers can do. Um, the, really the right way to get this changed, we're open to re-adding functionality where it makes sense. I think it's just a question of getting us feedback, helping us understand what value you were getting in running your own guilds, your own communities, and we'll see what we can do. And one of the things that we like to do is, it's kind of an opportunity to do stuff like this, is a lot of times there's a feature that people, or a function that people were using um, in the, to accomplish something in a roundabout weird way, where we could actually just find out what was the reason that you needed this before. Exactly. Oh wait, we can just give you a direct feature that just does that. So that's something that we can consider as totally. looking at this as well. Yeah, exactly, I think it's more, let us know the let us know what problems you're having and we will do what we can to solve those problems. Cool. 
Next question, uh, also about communities, comes from Shark, who said, are there plans to expand on the communities feature to make them usable for larger communities, i.e. bigger character caps, calendar improvements like recurring events, more moderation tools, et cetera? I know uh, moderation tools is something we've been talking about a bit. Yes. Um, so they're, they're one thing we definitely have on our on our feature list, probably for, an up for our next patch, um, will be permanent bans from public communities. So if you have a... If you have a you know, a large community that has a public link and there are troublemakers that are joining using that public link, currently you can kick them out, but without changing the link or removing that public link, it can be hard to stop them from rejoining. We want to have the ability to have a, a persistent ban that functions at the account level, so it doesn't matter what new characters they make, they won't be able to rejoin your community if you've chosen to exclude them. I think that should help a lot for larger public communities that are trying to, you know, maintain an orderly structure there. Beyond that, I think we rolled this feature out with sort of a foundation of a core of just persistent chat channels, a calendar for events, and just a structure with basic permissions. And we wanted to see how people are using communities. And we, rather than dictate how you should use them, or imagine how, what, what, sort of imagine in our minds what players want to do with this functionality and tailor it for that, we're actually just sitting back watching how people are using them. And I think would love to hear more requests for features and improvements. And I think that's going to guide the direction that we take with communities going forward. Okay. Makes sense. Next question from Silent Hit, uh, who asked, Island expeditions seem to be very unrewarding at the moment for the time spent in them. Any chance of having their rewards improved in some way to make them attractive after getting the big weekly Azerite bonus? So obviously, yeah. islands, the, the sort of the primary thing that you get out of them is that artifact power. Yes. How do we feel about um, the, the way that players are being rewarded through island expeditions right now? So there, there was a bug that we fixed very recently that could cause um, people to get less artifact power than advertised or intended at the end of an individual island expedition. And so that should help with some of those issues where you, like, you're like, wait, I was told I was going to get 225 for winning this, and I only got 150. What gives? That won't happen anymore. So that should help there. That said, I think the weekly quest, the weekly objective to collect 40,000 Azerite from the islands is actually kind of there to create an exit point for you. Uh, once you've completed that, that is the clear, very efficient, lucrative reward. It's similar to you know, back in the old days when you would get Valor points from doing dungeons or something like that. Once you've gotten all your points for the week, I mean, you can keep running them, but it's, it's less rewarding than the first set. And so if you, you know, it's okay to feel like you're done with islands for the week, wait for the new rotation, wait for a new set of three islands with three different ecologies associated with them to come in the following week and pick up, the, pick up there. Now, islands do remain, per time spent, I think pretty much the best source of Azerite and artifact power other than you know, if there's a lucrative world quest out there. And so for someone who is looking to get all the AP they can get to level up their Heart of Azeroth and they've scoured the map, finished all their world quests, you should find that doing islands, especially with a group, is going to be more rewarding than doing dungeons from an AP per time perspective. But it's deliberate that there is a drop off there. OK. Um, just sort of a side question on this. How do we feel about artifact power and its just general rewardingness in uh, BFA in general right now? Because I've actually seen uh, I've actually seen similar mm -hmm. feedback to this about uh, missions as well. And yeah. one of the primary things that you get from missions right now is that that artifact power. But it does kind of also seem like a lot of players are going, okay, well, I've, I've unlocked the, all the rings on my Azerite gear that I've got right now. I don't need artifact power anymore at this point. It's kind of the, yeah. the general sense. There's some, there some transitional stages. I think the experience of hitting max level, there's definitely a bit of awkwardness there. I think when you hit max level right now, certainly you should have all of the gear that you got while leveling up, probably a lot of 295s, fully unlocked, and it can be unclear why you'd need or want more. Um, and then what people were finding during the first week is, let's say you got a good world quest reward or you got a, you got a group together and went into a mythic dungeon, you might be getting a piece where you didn't even have enough Azerite at all to unlock even the outermost ring, which, which put you in this weird limbo state where it wasn't clear why you wanted it in the short term and the long term goals felt too far away. Uh, we've, we've gone through and made some hot fixes to tune that progression. So okay. I think at this point, as you're getting dungeon gear, generally... We want you to be able to use the outer ring of gear pretty much right away, unless you're quite far behind where we expect you to be for that point in progression. Like, yeah, if you're hitting max level and getting carried through a mythic dungeon literally 30 minutes after hitting max level, you right, might not be yeah, able to yeah. use that piece. But short of that, 
the outer ring should be a starting point, and then you'll have goals to work towards, especially once you get to those epic pieces that have four tiers of powers to unlock rather than just three. And ideally, if you have a full set of gear from a given type of content, let's say you have three 340s from Mythic Dungeons, every level on your Heart of Azeroth should unlock something on some piece of your gear. Okay. Let's move on. Next question. Uh, I actually don't know how to pronounce this. Jayut, uh 112 Sure. Uh, from this person on Twitter who asked, uh, will there be any change to Azerite gear and it being untradeable? Uh, my friend got five pieces of shoulders as a warrior, and it was frustrating to him not being able to give me one as a rep paladin. Rip. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that sucks. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think we made a mistake there. Uh, that's something we're actually going to change. So... Oh. Uh, current plan is to roll out a hotfix that will take effect with weekly resets next week that makes Azerite gear tradable, like other pieces of like like other pieces of equipment and weapons, as long as you have something of that item level or better in that slot. Uh, why do we do this in the first place? I think two probably in retrospect misguided concerns. I think some of it was thinking of like wow, there's a lot of complexity to these items. They have different traits for different classes. And if I, you know, a piece of leather drops is a rogue and a demon hunter and a monk all looking at that and thinking about like what this does for me, that's a whole lot to compare in terms of do I want this and should I trade for it? In practice, stuff's in the dungeon journal. I think people go into a dungeon knowing, hey, there's really good shoulders I want from this boss. They have the trait that I'm really after. You know the name of the item you're looking for. It's not that different from a trinket in those terms. Second, second consideration was as right armor, there's reason to want different pieces for different specs or for different loadouts. Maybe I want one piece that has more of a single target focus, and I'll use this for raiding. I have this other piece that I'm going to, you know, has a good AoE trait. I'm going to wear that set when I do Mythic Plus Dungeons. And so it's with, with trading, we always want, we're cautious about situations where items that people genuinely want to keep are tradable. And then there's social pressure imposed to, to give up something that you genuinely view as an upgrade. In practice, that's equally true for things like trinkets. We might have an AoE versus a single target trinket or a, an off-roll trinket that you want to use for tanking that might be tradable, and it's up to you. And th those downsides aren't enough to justify the annoyance of, hey, this item drop that I don't need, my friend could really use it, and I can't give it to him or her. So we'll be fixing that next week. Uh, sorry for that pain the first couple of weeks. We agree it was a mistake. Well, and I think it's a good thing to be overly cautious about as well because if we were to get into a situation where we thought yeah. oh crap we really should have made these untradeable hypothetically speaking mm -hmm. say the roles were reversed here and everyone was like why does everyone keep stealing my azurite pieces it would be much more disruptive for us to say okay now you can't trade these anymore than it would be for yeah. us to start with you can't trade them and then add that functionality in uh it, exactly that, that, that's why after. we are we're often conservative with our designs because we know it's, it's easier to loosen restrictions than to add them if we feel it's needed down the line once people are used to not having them. But that definitely means that we need to be able to recognize when we've made a mistake and right. act accordingly. I think that's, what, that's what's happened here. Cool. Uh, next question here from Tip who asked, explain the catch-up mechanic with AP. I've heard different things. Would like some info. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so there is a background knowledge system where it's sort of the over time your heart of Azeroth becomes better attuned to the energies of the planet and requires less Azerite to level it up. Uh, that process is currently planned to start next week. So I think with weekly resets, when people log in, they'll find that you know if you needed 7,000 or whatever artifact power to max, to get your next level, you will need less, maybe 5,500 or 5,000 or, you know, I'm not doing the math in my head right now, but something along those lines. Uh, the goal is this, is, this is, this should work functionally exactly like Knowledge worked in Legion once we made it a passive background system in 7.3. Um, the only difference is rather than multiplying the numbers that you're getting, we're reducing the amount required. Math-wise, it's going to be the same impact. The upside is that numbers should feel relatively constant. You will understand that when you see something that rewards 500 artifact power, that's a hefty chunk of artifact power, and that's always going to be that case, whether it's now or two patches from now, versus dealing in the millions and billions. Okay, yeah, it just keeps us away from the this quest is going to give me two trillion artifact power. I don't actually even know what that means anymore. Exactly. Sort of thing towards the yeah. end of the expansion. Cool. 
A uh, question here from Beps, who uh, asked, any plans to increase the incentive slash bonus for war mode? After 120, I've noticed very few people are left in my war mode shard compared to non-war mode. Uh, so, a couple of pieces here. So, the bonus for war mode is something we're being very careful with. I think we want to strike a balance where it feels like a nice carrot for people who like world PvP. It feels like it's making up for the inconvenience of hey, I went to do this world quest, and oh boy, there's a whole bunch of horde players in this area, or a whole bunch of alliance players in this area, I can't. Or I got ganked by a rogue and had to run back, and that hurt my efficiency. Um, we want to offset that, but we don't want to make it so rewarding that people feel obligated to opt into a type of gameplay they genuinely don't enjoy. And so that's a very difficult balance to strike. Um, we've been paying a lot of attention to war mode population in general. I think we're looking to increase war mode populations overall on both sides and looking at logic that can cause shard imbalances to occur. I think something we're seeing now at max level that we weren't seeing previously is, like I mentioned earlier, in the context of these uh, elite world quests, there might be a war mode elite world quest that's up, a group finder group forms for it, fills quickly with you know 40 alliance that kill that enemy, now suddenly more horde are brought into that shard as they're entering the zone to balance out the populations. But really, there was just this giant 40-player raid right. that disbanded and scattered to the winds and used their whistles and used their hearthstones as soon as the enemy was dead. And now we have a suddenly lopsided shard. We're looking at things we can do to detect patterns like those and overall work to improve the balance. I think we're happy with it, it's been awesome seeing a lot of the experiences that have come out of war mode in these last couple of weeks i think personally one of my favorite things to do is the feeling of going to the enemy continent to do your war campaign world quests with war mode on and you know that you're in enemy lands and you see red names far more often because you're just outside their capital cities but you want to do your world quests that's a feeling of danger that you know I haven't felt personally in world PvP since you know the first time I walked into you know Ashenvale or going to or trying to quest in Hillsbrad as a horde player when there were high level alliance all yeah. around, and that's kind of awesome. Uh, it's more our focus right now is on making those experiences more consistent rather than you know scattered. Okay, uh, it's also possibly worth noting. Uh, I mentioned a couple of times expansion has been out for a week and a half now. Um, there are a lot of people that were still leveling. Um, totally. So there will be more 120s as time goes on that can actually be in your war mode shard, which will hopefully help as well. Yeah, and they'll be focused around the same world quest areas as opposed to scattered around leveling sections exactly. in the zone, which means you'll have those world PvP encounters far more often. Okay. Uh, question here from Solified. I know that we've kind of talked about this a lot, but it, yeah. it keeps coming up, so it's worth clarifying real quickly again. Uh, war mode on RP realms, are we phased with any other server or are we just on our server? Yep, so... RP realms, by and large, you are just on your own server. Um, that said, I think this is something that we're, we're looking at and listening to feedback from about RP realms. So, sharding in RP realms, there's some exceptions during high traffic periods around launch. For example, we turned on sharding in Stormwind and Orgrimmar for the release of you know Battle for Lordaeron or the launch of the expansion, because otherwise, when you have the thousands of people on a server all converging to get this quest from Anduin or to talk to Sarfang, servers melt. And while we want to give you know, a cohesive realm experience to our peers, we don't want your servers to crash. Um, that said, it's, it, may, it may well be that for many realms, a single realm doesn't have enough people interested in playing on war mode to provide a meaningful experience there. And so that's something we're looking at. And the right balance to strike may be sharding RP realms for war mode only with each other, so there's a larger pool, but you're still not interacting with people by default who haven't opted into the RP experience. Um, we know there's a lot of sensitivity around the subject of realm identity within that within those communities, so that's, that's an area where I think we'd love to hear feedback and thoughts from people on RP servers who are interested in war mode. What experience would you prefer? Um, we, we, we definitely could offer a more balanced and more match-made experience and a more vibrant world if we were clumping all their RP realms together for war mode, but we don't want to also you know, undermine core identity there. Okay. Uh, next question here from Rikros, who asked, uh, when deciding on the gearing system for PvP, why did you choose a fixed reward schedule when vendors provided players the ability to target and work towards the specific upgrade they wanted? Uh, I think for, for some time now, even, even when we had vendors in the past, there often was a clear structure to them, whether it was 
total conquest points earned during the season requirements on the individual pieces or rating requirements on the individual pieces. There was generally a correct order in which to acquire your gear. Um, whether it was you know getting gloves with a bonus on them first or assembling your set, certainly you'd want to get your weapon as early as you could. And I think we're possible, given the choice between presenting a direct reward in the UI where you can open the window and see, hey, if I do this activity, I'm going to get that helm or I'm going to get that axe, given the choice between that and, hey, I'm going to get a currency where I have to know to go to a vendor and then I'm going to buy a thing off a vendor, we always prefer to give rewards directly. And so that's the structure we opted with here. I think the, the conquest schedule is there as a certain backbone to your progression, a guarantee that you will get all of these pieces if you participate. And then that's complemented by the re random rewards from end of match or end of week once the season officially starts. Yeah, and there were certainly some sort of like there were some big mistakes you could make with uh, vendors as well where yeah. if you were especially if you were just getting into PvP you were trying to figure out what was going on you're spending your conquest and you're like okay well I've got my 1250 I'll buy my ring this week not realizing that that means yeah. you can't get your weapon the next week so there there actually are some very very real advantages to the system yep. obviously for the extremely hardcore players who understood exactly what to buy in the right order uh, that's not really the case but mm -hmm you're kind of just getting that anyway because you're just getting it in the right yeah. order. So. And I think also, I think the when the system begins, I want to say the reward at the end of the first, filling your conquest bar the first time, I think gives you a 340 weapon. And so that's part of all, it also gives us a chance to make sure that everybody has that essential piece of gear going into the system um, if that's one they want to participate in. Cool. Uh, next question here from J Funk Gaming who asked, uh, what are your plans on how to target specific high eye level Azerite pieces in the future? Obviously, a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, especially if you haven't been following Azerite armor super closely throughout the beta, um, you're sort of comparing Azerite pieces to legendaries and worried that we're going to run into similar situations that we have with legendaries. We're just sort of hoping for that perfect piece. Um, Azerite armor actually works very differently. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, they're fixed pieces with fixed sources. And so if there is you know, a raid boss in Eldir that drops the piece you want, well, you have a chance every week and a second chance if you bonus roll and maybe a third chance soon when it can drop for someone else and they can trade it to you if they already have it to get that piece. Um, and so I think that said, there is a bit less control over the weekly Mythic Plus chest because that pulls from the entire pool of items. And I think that's something that we, we actually, we, we don't have a great solution to currently, but it's something we're discussing because we, we don't want to fee we don't want people who are focused on the Mythic Plus gameplay to feel like they have no control over seeking out a certain trait. But it's a much more targetable, fixed, certain system than either Legendaries or like the Netherite Crucible, for example. Okay. Uh, speaking of dungeons, next question here from Item, spelled strangely, who says, um, some dungeons, especially the mother load, I always feel like I need to shout that, the mother load, feel like they have too many trash mobs. Are there plans to reduce the amount of trash in any dungeons? Not currently. Um, we actually, we've been looking at clear completion times for all of our dungeons, and they're pretty much completely in line with, with legions. They're spot on for where we'd expect them to be early in the expansion. I think that said, there are, there are definitely differences. Some dungeons will have more gauntlet type events or you know special things like going through Temple of Sethralis and dodging the lightning gauntlet or doing King's Rest and spending a fair chunk of time in a single room dealing with a series of waves of lieutenant level enemies rather than going through a longer hallway. That's, that's just consistent with WoW dungeon design since the beginning. You know, sometimes you have your Shattered Halls, sometimes you have your Violet Holds, and there's two opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to the composition of those dungeons. Um, I think early on, certainly if you're comparing your experience running dungeons at the very minimum gear level, like you're, you just hit 305, you're queuing up for your first heroics, everything is just going to take longer than what you're accustomed to in Legion. And that can feel jarring if you're, if you're comparing it to, well, this isn't what I remember Halls of Valor feeling like a few months ago. There's a reason for that. But as people build up experience running the dungeons and understand which pulls are more dangerous, which pulls are less dangerous, and which you can take more, you know, more aggressively as people improve their gear levels. I think clearing through those enemies between bosses will just continue to speed up. Okay. Uh, moving along, question from Kagosi who asked, "How do you plan on keeping world quests relevant once people have capped out on reputation and Mythic Plus uh, slash raids become the primary source of gear upgrades?" So, um, I mean, I think they're still going to be a great source of artifact power and. That's always a universal reward there. There will still be 
individual things that you see. You'll want war resources to run your missions to get the rewards from that system. But it's actually totally okay that if you are a high-end raider or deep into Mythic Plus and you're getting gear from there, you have way less reason to do world quests. And I think that's actually part of why we've put world quest rewards, sorry, we've put emissary rewards visible up front rather than hiding them away in boxes so that you can decide, you know what, if the reward for today's emissary is a 340 pair of boots and I have 355 boots from a raid, I don't really feel like I need to do that emissary if I don't want the rep, and that's totally okay. I think it's fine to graduate out of types of content or to focus on one type of content and feel like you don't need to do the others based on your own personal play style. Now, if you're gearing up alts or you're doing other things, that's still going to be a great system. Similarly, if you're someone who focuses primarily on, you know, maybe you do some raid finder here or there, but you're mostly a solo outdoor content player, then it's going to be relevant for a long time to come. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question. We don't have a ton of time left, so I'm just going to try and move through these as best we can. A uh, question from Nith- Nithin Arena. Uh, could we please have an update on new Worgen and Goblin models? So, yes, yeah, so I think this remains at the same place it was when we talked about it last BlizzCon. Uh, this is something we definitely want to do, we are committed to do. Uh, it wasn't g- going to be able to happen in time for Battle for Azeroth launch, but. We know that Worgen and Goblin in particular are sort of below the fidelity bar that we've set for all of our other races with the upreses that we've done to them. And so this is something that we will do. And I look forward to sharing more information as soon as we have information to share. I think that that's likely going to come in the form of really cool pictures and videos of what they actually look like because talking about it doesn't really do it justice. Oh, they're so cool, you guys. They're so cool. Yeah, yeah exactly. We, we want to be able to actually show it to you. Uh, but yeah, it's coming, guys. It's coming. A uh, question from Ciola, who says, uh, Horde aren't getting Honorbound rep for the Wanted quests in Cool Tiras, while uh, Alliance get reps for completing Wanted quests in Zandalar. Is this intended? Um, we So we think that this generally is. I also don't think that's an accurate statement. We're still looking into the details. Definitely saw this discussion pop up in the community in the last couple days. Um, there are a bunch of wanted quests on both sides on the opposite faction's continent. Some of them do give war campaign rep, some don't. Uh, it's not accurate that Alliance get rep from all the wanted quests. They don't. Um, it's also not accurate that Horde get no rep from all the wanted quests. They do get from some of them. Um, we're looking at the overall balance there to make sure that it's not too out of whack. Um, if it ends up being significantly skewed, what we'd probably do is add rep to those quests and maybe reset progress on them for those who have already done them so they can go back and earn that rep. But we're not 100% sure there's an actual problem here. We want to survey the entire you know pool of quest content on both sides to make sure there's some parity. Okay. So basically we're looking into it. Yep. Um, I think we already kind of answered that one. So um, well, actually. So do you want to go ahead and sure. answer it? Okay. Cool. A question from Mamea who said, uh, any comments as to why emissary rewards are different between factions? So, in other words, why did Horde in Europe get a weapon and Alliance didn't? Uh, I think this was the case a couple days ago. The answer is it's random. Um, we're not sitting there handcrafting, you know, okay, this is the emissary that's going to be up tomorrow and it's going to give this reward to this faction because we like them more. It actually just boils down to we have pools of available quests and pools of available rewards and a system that sort of pseudo-randomizes them to make sure that we're cycling through the emissaries without too many repeats or without... Too, many, too long a gap between the same emissary coming up twice, and because the Honorbound and 7th Legion are separate factions, separate emissaries, separate quests, there's separate logic that's used to pick them, and it will be equally likely, and I'm certain it will happen in the future, the Lions have something amazing one day, and Horde have something comparably mediocre. But that's random. Okay. Well, I look forward to my mediocre reward. <laughs> that's That's what we do. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Question here from one of the best names that I've seen in a while, Cad Garlic, who said, is there a reason for the overwhelming amount of quests in the latest zones? Uh, people in Kultiris and Zandalar have a lot of problems, and they need help from heroes. Sometimes, you know, they've lost things. Sometimes they need to matchmake Lovestruck, Brontosauri with each other. Um a standard wow but no so i think we have wanted to fill the world out with more side quests where possible to give people more choices and options uh when leveling their characters when leveling their alts different content to do things to go back and do at max level if you want i think 
one of the criticisms we had looking back at Legion was that some of the zones in Legion felt like they existed just to tell a specific story. They were almost too on rails, that other than a single side quest here or there, you just felt like, okay, I'm going through the sequence of events to complete an important objective, but that's all the zone is there for, rather than being, as had more traditionally been the case in World of Warcraft over time, an organic place that's a living, breathing place in the world full of its own inhabitants with their own problems. Now, the one thing that we want to do, we want to improve, kind of like how we've done with the war campaign, is we'd like to do a better job of calling out what is the main line, quest line, in a given zone. So that no one is ever, you know, if you're questing through Voldoon or you're questing through Stormsong, you're certain that you're doing a mainline quest versus a side quest versus feeling like you have to do all the side quests you see because you don't know if they're actually mainline quests. Like, maybe you actually do need to get those two Brontosauri to hook up in order to solve Rastakhan's problems. You never know what our storytellers are going to do. The key, the key to saving Azeroth is, yeah, I'm not even going to finish yeah. that thought. All right, uh, this is going to be the last question okay. that we have time for. Um, but I still think it's a good one. Uh, it comes from Joel House of L, who said, uh, "Will we see the social impact of the faction war on other races of Azeroth, like, for example, how the Pandaren deal with this conflict?" Definitely. I think this is actually this is a cool area that we're we're looking forward to exploring over the course of the expansion. We've seen little bits of it, but both the Alliance and the Horde are comprised of varied races with their own motivations, their own histories, and this war means something different to each of them. Um, and so that's something we do plan to explore as Battle for Azeroth unfolds. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, for being here, coming yeah. on here and answering as always. questions. Um, I, I'm, I think we got to some pretty good ones here today. So I do appreciate you coming on here. Thanks again so much, everybody, for tuning in and watching. Uh, again, it's all the time we have for today. But uh, we will see you guys in the near future. All right. Sounds good. Have a great day, everybody. Okay. Thanks again. See you.